Oh, hey everybody, it's Romania Black, and it's only episode six of season two of Jujitsu Kaisen, bitches! We're off hiatus, yeah! <laughs> it has been a, it has been a very, um, it's not been a long hiatus, which has been good, but it's, it's felt simultaneously like it's gone by like that, and like it's lasted 20 years. So, however you want to phrase that, it's just been wild, and I'm really excited to be diving back into the present timeline, see what's been going on. We've just dealt with five weeks of tragedy. So why not go back to some happy times with our main trio of Yuji and Megumi and Nobara. So yeah, why not? Why not? So um, I'll be honest, I, I did not have time to watch the recap episode um, for season one. I'm very sorry, but my work right now is insane. It's back to school time and as a teacher and doing all stuff with coaching. It's just, it has been a lot these last couple weeks. I'm glad I had the hiatus because it let me catch up on stuff and get stuff set up that I needed to. But I didn't have a chance to watch the, the recap. And people in the Discord had said there weren't any crazy subtitles for the recap of season one. And I was like, okay. So I, I feel like I remember enough from season one if I need to, after this episode, if some things I'm like, oh, who are these characters? What's going on? Then I may go back and rewatch the recap uh, before episode seven. I may do that, right? If I feel like I need to go back and see some things. But for now, I feel pretty good. But I've got lots of comments to talk about uh, before we start. Last week, I did a video uh, doing all the ghetto and Gojo shippable things because that, that was a thing in itself. <laughs> I looked at the OP and ED lyrics and then I realized that I need to go through and look at the other comments that basically are ramping up to this. So I want to talk about these comments before we get started. Uh, very first I made, I had to make notes. I had to make notes online because my own handwriting was just getting too awful. Um, I did go back and rewatch the movie though. And in the movie, it's really sad because Yuda, Yuda, I feel like to ghetto might've reminded him of Hybara especially when Yuda has this conviction to save his friends. I feel like there's like a simplicity to Yuda that maybe Ghetto was reminded of Hybara through, which I thought was really interesting. Um, Jake Collins, and you'll have to forgive me, my dog is being as persistent as Gojo this evening. Jake Collins notes that Ghetto realizes he can't steal curses from people they are actually connected to, which is why he knows that Toji is dead when he gets the worm. And he realizes through that in the movie that he has to kill Yuda to get Rika, which creates the conflict of killing a jiu-jitsu high school student that he doesn't want to do, but he wants the curse. So thus we have conflict. So I thought that was really good. And Jake Collins and Ashley Roy both talked about how Maki apparently has some cursed energy. It's talked about in season one. But not much because she still needs glasses to see spirits. And her heavenly pack, therefore, isn't as strong as Toji's. And like we established with Yuki in episode five, Toji was kind of a, a one in a million shot. And so it's just kind of like, man, wish that Gojo hadn't killed him. <laughs> but here we are. Right? But here we are. Could have done some research, you know, maybe help some, you know, curses not be born, but can't go back now. No take backsies. Uh, Tamiya talks about the color symbolism in episode five of Ghetto in the white shirt when he adopts the twins. Is it him revealing his true self? And I would add to that being that at the very end of that episode, he drapes the black Gojo Kessa over him for showmanship, showing that it's not really how perhaps he feels inside. But at this point, he's made his resolve. He's dug his grave and now he has to lie in it. So thought that was interesting. Gein talks about in 2006, there was an earthquake in Japan. So it would make sense in the timeline that several incidents that Ghetto is referring to between episodes one and five could be referring to that earthquake or that's how the show like ties the earthquake into the actual events, right? I thought that was interesting. Um, Alessia Kali notes that it makes sense now with Nanami leaving after Hybara's death. And we know now the four special grade sorcerers, Ghetto, Gojo, Yuta, and Yuki, or is it three now, depending on how you view Ghetto in this situation, right? Is he still a, a special grade sorcerer if he's supposedly dead? We don't know, right? Uh, Seppi talks about Hybara in the OP. I thought this was really cool. Hybara in the OP was always looking back to check on everyone. And then no one is able to check on him when he's alone on his mission. Like... That's so good. Uh, it's so sad, right? And with Habara's death, it helps explain why Nanami cannot answer Yuji in what is a proper death because 
Was Hybara's death proper? Did he have regrets? We don't know. We don't know. We just find Hybara dead, but we don't know what the situation was and we don't know if he had regrets or if it was a proper death. Hmm. Kaylin V talks about how Ghetto wanted to save the jujitsu sorcerers like Hybara from dying while the non-sorcerers didn't care and took vengeance for them. But Gojo, in contrast, seems adrift after the breakup and ends up with Megumi, who is the son of the man that started this whole thing and saved him despite the pain that he caused, which is kind of a tie into transcendence and forgiveness. Yes, Ghetto is just wanting to save the other jujitsu sorcerers from situations like Hybara, but in the end, it's just creating this cycle of violence and nothing changes. And Gojo, in contrast, is saying, yeah, I know Toji, like, he killed Rico, he did these things, but I'm going to save his kid. And it's almost like, it's almost like an act of forgiveness and that transcendence that Gojo experiences in episode four, where he doesn't feel any grudge towards anyone and he's just trying to do what he feels is right. Interesting. Uh, Koga00 noted that the hidden inventory arc is actually translated to harboring jade, which means a person possessing great talent. So that could refer to Rico being the vessel, it could refer to Gojo, it could refer to Toji, and premature death actually means the jade breaks which could refer to all three of them and ghetto as well. The death of a virtuous individual is another meaning, which could mean Hybara or it can mean ghetto, the virtuous individual being ghetto that dies and then is reborn as we see him now. Um, Ifat Bushra, Bushra Sui noted that there was character info from the character book on Toji. And I was like, I'm usually very much against that because if it's something that's going to be brought up later, I don't want to know. But in this case with Toji, I took a chance and was like, I think it's okay. And the mods were like, it's okay. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Cause I do have moderators checking the comments um, that he apparently Toji stopped gambling and stopped being a sorcerer when he married his wife. And he was a good husband according to Gege um, until she died shortly after having Megumi and he fell back into his old ways, which is really sad that he was a nice, he became a nice man. And then the moment she died, he kind of reverted back to his older self. And Gojo talked about, re, talks about reforming the Jiu-Jitsu society and allies himself with people like Yuji. Toji wanted to make those same changes. So the, the cruel irony is that if Toji had been able to stay alive, him and Gojo could have become these really great allies. And it's like, why can't we have nice things, show? <laughs> why not? Crazy. Um, Sarah Linda noted that you can't force evolution. It's more through selective reproduction, like with Toji and Megumi and Gojo from his clan. So Sarah Linda brought up this really good point that, yeah, the, the, it seems on paper like, oh, well, if you just, you know, let call out the people without curses, or if you let, you know, people naturally evolve, then they'll become like Gojo, but that's not really gonna happen. Like it, there's a one in a million chance you're gonna be like Toji, Gojo, or Megumi. You're not just gonna force an evolution like that. Instead, you're just gonna cause a massacre. So it, it puts a lot of damper on Ghetto's plan and pointing out some, some big flaws in it, which I thought was good to bring up. Anime Annie says that Gojo's ability has become like teaching his brain AI in that it fixes itself and auto detects dangers, which is crazy. Gojo's brain being AI is, just bizarre. It's so bizarre to me. And then Alexander Q says that Toji eating the cursed worm shows that he did know what Ghetto was going through. And I hadn't thought about that, but Toji eating the worm shows that he did know what a cursed spirit tasted like. And Ghetto is so certain that no one knows what he under, no one can understand what Ghetto understands. And in this one moment, we're like, no, Toji would have understood. He would have understood if you'd talked to him about it. But that wasn't allowed to happen, right? Couldn't have happened because of the pact and everything else. Yaga's reaction and not realizing how Ghetto had spiraled shows the lack of understanding that the school had for its students and also shows why Gojo is more focused on paying attention to his students in season one. I agree with that. And then Alexander Q says there is no perfect solution. Someone is always going to be in danger in this world and Gojo is doing what he thinks will work best and give people the most choices, which I agree is interesting as well. Yeah, Gojo's like, somebody's always gonna potentially get hurt. It's just, let's give people choices. Whereas Ghetto's like, let's take those choices away and make things simpler. And then finally, Baron says that Gege has said that Gojo presently still thinks that caring for the weak is tiring. But I would add to that, he doesn't think it's wrong. 
being something being exhausting and tiring is one thing, but something being wrong can be something entirely different. So I was like, yeah. So those were some amazing comments. I got through them in 10 minutes. I feel so proud of myself. But yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lie. This wig sucks. <laughs> It does not feel comfortable at all. These bangs, I feel like a Final Fantasy character. Gojo, this is not flawless, like, to Gojo standards. So, I feel like I'm right now, I don't know, not Steve Jobs, but I feel like I'm, I'm going to design a computer company <laughs> at this point, right? I feel like a conductor that's also going to design a computer system. So, there we go. I don't feel like Gojo, but that's okay. So I'm super excited, y'all. I know we've waited so long for this episode and it's here and I'm, I'm living for it. I'm living for it. So we're not going to waste any more time. I need to make myself a, a bang curtain <laughs> so I can watch this. Yes. <laughs> and then we are going to get ready and start episode, episode 30 technically, but season two, episode seven, right? So let me get the subtitles on. We got the subtitles on. We got sound. We are ready to go, y'all. So we are going to start. I'm so excited. We are going to start episode seven of, episode six of season two, Jitsu Kaisen. I'm getting the cart before the horse here in three, two, one. And oh my gosh, y'all. Let's, uh, let's jam. This is going to be the happiest we are for the rest of the season, right? <laughs> man! Man! Jujutsu Kaisen, it ain't, it ain't messing around! <laughs> I had to take this wig off. I The wig cap was starting to, like, compress my brain, and I felt like it was going to just, like, it was like when you put those rubber bands around a watermelon and it just burst in two. That's how my head felt, so I was like, no, we're not going to risk a headache. We're going to take that wig off and zhuzh my hair and just go with it. But, man... I, I freaking loved this episode, <laughs> but it is very apparent. It is very apparent, Gege. Gege, we know. We know. We've just, we've just gone through this song and dance at the beginning of the season. We just had a beach episode not too long ago. We know how this song and dance goes, where Gege is like, oh, guys, no, there's no worries. I'm, they're at the movies. Yuji has a new potential girlfriend. They're going shopping. They're having fun times. They're just walking around together having a good old time. No, I know what this means. It means we are about to go through hell. And I'm not ready for that. <laughs> so... Megamaru! Megamaru! I, I don't remember. I would have to, again, I remember them talking about a mole being in the system and there being a mole that they thought was leaking information, but I don't remember thinking it was Mechamaru. I kept thinking it was someone higher up, like Mei Mei, or I didn't think it was Udahime, I don't believe so, but I kept thinking it was like Mei Mei potentially being the mole or like someone that Yagi knew or the old man. I kept thinking it was somebody higher up that would be the mole gathering that would give information, but in hindsight, it makes sense that it was Mechamaru because, one, your older jujitsu sorcerers would likely not be working with Ghetto or Mahito as a cursed spirit because they'd be, they're too snobbish for that, right? If we've established anything, it's that the old jujitsu sorcery world is very elitist, very snobby, very much thinks that they're better than everyone, and Gojo kind of hates that, and he's trying to alter that, and he's got people like Nanami and Udahime and others that support him in that claim. But it makes sense that none of them hoity-toity, like, pearl-clutching jujitsu sorcerers from high up would want to work with Mahito of all curses. Mahito is just like, he's like, he's the Hanamiya from Kuroko's Basketball. He's the Chirong from Heaven Official's Blessing. Mahito is the trash king of this series, but he's absolutely terrifying. He's like Ursula on crack. He's just, ah, crazy talk, right? And then Ghetto, I don't know what to make with Ghetto. Gege is being very smart in not having Ghetto do anything. Because it feels like if Ghetto does anything, then it's gonna be noticeable that it's it's not Ghetto from before, it's a different Ghetto. Because yeah, it, it, the crazy thing is that Ghetto sounds the same. It's not like, it's not like a, a different voice that Ghetto has, the same voice actor, same voice that Ghetto has. The cadence is calm and collected, 
but that's not anything un the the difference between the movie though is movie ghetto was perf purposefully being trolly to get it get to get under gojo's skin right and to like put on this facade the ghetto that's in the current season doesn't seem to be doing that but he's not really doing anything he gege is playing things very close to the vest with this ghetto because we're like well how is he alive what's happening why has he got the lobotomy what's going on and Gege is playing things close to the chest and not making Ghetto do really anything. Because at this point, I mean, Mahito's doing all of the work. Ghetto could easily just like spew out some cursed spirits, right? And just have this whole thing wrapped up with and done. But like I said at the end of the OP and ED reaction from last week, if Ghetto has been, if his corpse has been taken over by another curse, then it's very likely that Ghetto's original powers aren't able to be used perhaps because if, if my theory is that ghetto his either one of two things either somebody has manipulated ghetto's curse his corpse and is controlling him from elsewhere but i don't think that's the case because ghetto seems pretty autonomous he doesn't seem like a puppet so instead i think that maybe one of the curses that ghetto had ate is now taken over his corpse and is using it and because of that it can't use his ability so or his curse technique so it just can you know do veils and maybe it has the same strength as ghetto just not the technique so which ghetto is really strong so that's still a threat and if ghetto's and you know ghetto's able to manipulate things because of his strength then that's a threat too so i don't know the fact that gege is being so so mysterious as a mangaka and not letting us know much is concerning because i think that when we do find out what's going on it's going to be very disturbing and i'm not sure i'm ready for that but but who wants to talk about that when we have these happy, fun adventure times with our th main trio? Man, again, we talked about the first couple episodes. I really like that Yuji and Nobara and Megumi are not like Ghetto, Gojo, and Shoko. They are very different characters, very different. And I feel like Nobara and Shoko mirror each other the most in terms of like their haircut being short from back when Shoko was younger, but their personalities are completely different, right? And I just love the idea that we've gone back to like 2018, 2019. So we have our cell phones out there. Them damn kids walking around with their cell phones. So Megumi gets picked up. I like now that we know that Megumi is kind of, you know, in the system with Gojo that he he's like the little elite kid that gets picked up by the by the wealthy family but Megumi's like whatever it's great and then oh my god the whole thing about Yuji asking Nobara to go to a movie with him I love Yuji I forget how baggy his uniform is it's very baggy and it, it which has to you know compensate for the muscles it's gonna get as as Sukuna so <laughs> But he asks Snowbar to go to the movies with him. And I've never wanted Junpei to be alive more than I have been in this moment so that Yuji could go to the movies with Junpei. Because you know Junpei would jump at the opportunity to go see Human Earthworm 4. And Nobara's just like, now to be fair, Yuji's whole spiel about Human Earthworm 4 is exactly what my brother would do. My brother's a big fan of the Tremors movies. I've only seen the first one with Kevin Bacon in it. <laughs> but my brother loves all the Tremors movies. He's seen like, there's like four of those. He's seen all four of them. He raves about them. He's like, well, in, in Tremors 3, this happens. And my reaction is basically like Nabara's where I'm like, I don't want to see a movie about worms. <laughs> I saw one and that was enough, enough for me. But can we take a moment to appreciate, I'm going to take so many screenshots. Can we take a moment to appreciate the the entire production value that they used going into talking about human earthworm 4 and i like that obara's like i've not seen one two or three and yuji's like oh well, you can just jump into the fourth one here i'll catch you up really quick as to what's going on i went and saw the third lord of the rings film in high school and it was Return of the King. I was in the theater. It was my dad, my friend, and her mom, and then my other friend from high school. And we're sitting there. And my friend and I, whose parents went with us, we were like Lord of the Rings nerds. We knew everything about the series. My other friend came with us because he was like, oh my gosh, I want to see Legolas. He's hot. <laughs> I was like, okay. So we're sitting there. And as the movie starts, my friend looks over at me and goes, so I didn't see the second one. What happened? <laughs> So as like the first like opening credits are playing, I'm trying to catch him up to speed with what what happened in the second Lord of the Rings movie. And I was like, all oh, this happened and this happened and then the extended version this happened and it was a nightmare. So whenever Yuji was like, oh, well, you can just jump in on the fourth one. I was like, no, she cannot. <laughs> 
they do the movie saying the mad scientist from the first one, Dr. Richter, is making his long-awaited appearance. Oh my god, so it's like talking about the mad scientist from the first film is coming back into the fourth film. I want to see if there's maybe anything that would tie into possibly the story itself, or if Gege was just being ridiculous and making a fly parody. And the human hybrid earthworm fusion born from the doctor's experiments. And then, yeah, there's like the very handsome man that gets turned into the earthworm, the enhanced earthworm. Oh my god. Ridiculous. The poor human earthworm who barely escaped Dr. Richter with his life. Oh my god! Finally wanders into a campground where a group of college students are. And this is where the story begins. I just love the production value of everything they put in there. And so one of the people in the group is a kind woman who's an animal rights proponent. I was like, the baby earthworms killed me. I was like, oh my God. And the human falls in love with her. And he's like, I'm no longer human. And she's like, you're more human than anyone else. And like his creepy head, like, like the earthworm head like tilts up. Oh my God, I just, I can't. It's like The Fly. If you've ever seen The Fly with Jeff Goldblum, it's exactly like that. And they're like, it's a monster, kill it. And she's like, Kevin, stop. I like that's Kevin. And like, if we kill him, we're the monsters. Yeah, and then it kills him. And then all the little earthworm babies come out. And they're like, Papa. <laughs> What's wrong? Are you okay? Oh my God. Human earthworm four. The theme is actually love. One, I know why Toto and him are best friendos. Same energy, same vibe. But I, we need to write about this, okay? I freaking love Yuji Itadori. He is such, such a good protagonist. I, you know what? He's basically like, what if Hybara had lived? <laughs> it's really him, right? Because he's all about like the theme the theme of love and humanity. And yeah, I, I love that that one little scene of her being like, don't Kevin, stop. If we kill him, then we're the monsters. And I'm like, that's basically the theme of this entire show and its views on protecting the jiu-jitsu sorcery and, and thanks for playing it this earthworm film. In case if that wasn't clear to anybody. God, but I just, I love it, right? And so Yuji's like, it's just about love. He's very much like Toto in that. That's a theme of love and humanity. And he's so, I feel like the great thing about Yuji is he is very secure. And I love how he is secure and a good, a good representative of masculinity and um, a little bit of sexuality on there too, right? And what I mean by that is uh, Yuji very much is like a positive representation of masculinity and being like being masculine but not having like the macho protagonist vibes of love is stupid and I don't want it. No. You just like I the theme is love. Isn't that awesome? Like oh my gosh and there's like the girl and the guy get together. I feel like so many times in culture in our culture at least in US culture that anytime a guy like likes a romance story or anything that involves romance or love it's viewed as weak and demeaning and that's not macho or anything like that. And it's looked down upon as not being masculine. And I'm like, Yuji's a great example of no, you can totally do that. That's absolutely fine. And it doesn't make him any less of a man to show emotional vulnerability and to like people and show like, you know, that you enjoy romance. Like there's nothing wrong with it. I was like, yes, please. And the fact of how when he views like sexuality and views like attractiveness, he totally is basing his judgments on with the girl that we'll talk about on her personality and what she's great at and not her looks. Now, he distinctly says, because they're like, well, I thought you liked tall girls with big butts like Jennifer Lawrence. And he's like, well, that's its own thing. And that is the, that is the thing. The fact that he says that my celebrity crush is its own thing and then this is reality. Because yeah, there is a separation there. You can have a crush that's based on celebrity and, and that whole mold, but it's not the same as knowing people in real life. And, oh, I freaking love Eugene. I love him so much. And this, like the first minute and a half of this episode reminded me how much I love him. 
And Nobara's like, oh my god, please no. I won't go see Wormo Man. And he's like, not Wormo Man, human earthworm. She's like, no, let's go shopping. And I like that she's like, let's go shopping. And he's like, but I want to go see a movie. And I like that Yuji isn't um roped into going shopping with her. He's like, I want to go see the movie. No. And so he like takes off. And then we see the girl. It makes sense now that she's lost weight and she's still wearing like the oversized sweater and the oversized clothes because that's what she has. Now, again, this series does something really good where it gives us exposition while things are happening. So usually exposition can be really boring if it's, you just see people talking and standing there. But Jujutsu Kaisen finds a way to do it in a very fun way where things are happening and you just have to kind of pay attention to the dialogue or do like I'm doing and go back and rewatch it, right? Because she sees Yuji walk away. When she was looking at the stoplight and wondering whether to go or not, I was getting a little nervous thinking she was gonna get hit by a car and I was like, We've already had that happen with Yuta, so I'm sure that's not going to happen again, but made me a little bit, a little bit reserved. So then we go back to the old man saying that special grade is ranked reserved for those sorcerers who are exceptional. So we get the, the breakdown of the chain of command, right? We get the breakdown of the chain of command. So we have special grade. Special grade, I kind of view as the prodigies, right? the prodigies and the exceptions, but what I also think of as the problem children. Yeah, the problem children that nobody really wants to deal with because like Gojo can do whatever he wants. Yuki seems to be able to do whatever she wants and they don't really talk very favorable about Yuki in the flashback in episode five. They're just like, she just let her go on her motorcycle, do whatever. And then you have Yuna who they kind of just let go do whatever he wants to. Like he leaves the academy to go on these journeys and they're just like, I guess we can't stop him. So that's fascinating. And then obviously Ghetto's in there too. So you know, the special grades are kind of like outside of anybody's control and they just are like, well, we can't really do much about them. So just let them go, I guess. But the chances of them, you know, being large in number are extremely small. There's only four. So he says, in my opinion, the first grade sorcerers are the true rank who will lead other sorcerers in the jujitsu society. So we have the first, first grade. And our first grade are Toto, our Mei Mei, our um, Nanami. Is Udahime a first grade now or is she second grade? I can't remember. We're gonna put Udahime with a question mark over here. But they are basically considered the leaders of jujitsu society. And that kind of makes sense because I, as you would think your special grades would be the ones that would be like ruling them all. God, no, <laughs> we don't. they're the freaks, right? They're, they're the freaky ones. They're the ones we have to watch out for because they're, they're so special. They're dangerous, but luckily for us, they're on our side. So they're like, Yuna doesn't need to be in charge. God, Gojo does not need to be in charge. Ghetto, obviously no. And then Yuki seems like she could care less. So the ones who are leading Jiu Jitsu society are the first grades. The special ones are just, we'll just let them hang out in limbo and do whatever they want. They must stand above comparison to the semi first grades in terms of peril, secrecy, and salary. So we have semi first grades. I, why you can't just say second grades, why you've got to have a participation trophy for it, I don't know. But maybe Udahime is a semi first grade, I don't remember. Again, I'd probably have to go back and rewatch the recap after this to know for sure. But I like that they they basically have in terms of peril, secrecy, and salary. So in peril, they're going to face the da most dangerous missions, obviously. In terms of secrecy, they are going to be in charge of the information that nobody else needs to know about. And in terms of salary... I mean, I guess we'll pay him more <laughs> to compensate. I think that's the only reason Nanami's doing it is because he's like, I need the money just so I can buy all the baguettes I want. But the problem is he's like, okay, knowing all of this, knowing this in mind, they're, that they're going to go on dangerous missions, that they're going to be in charge of classified information, and that they're going to make the salary of an adult, who do you want to recommend to be the new first grades? And Mei Mei, so we need to put down Mei Mei, Mei Mei, wants to promote Panda and Maki and then uh, Toto who is a first grade wants to promote uh, Yuji, Megumi, 
and Novara. So basically, the, the old man is like, so you want to take these 15-year-olds, <laughs> these 16-year-olds, and um, put them in charge of classified information, let them have an adult salary, and put them in danger. And they're like, yes. I, I freaking love the way that's worded, right? And then we get the reveal about who you can and can't work with afterwards. I love Mei Mei when she like lifts up her braid in order to do that. It's really great. And my brother, Yuji Itadori. Oh my God, Toto, you freaking badass. And my name of Aoi Toto. And my name is Mei Mei. Mm -hmm. These five are recommended as first grade sorcerers. Yay. So then we have the tennis. Like, the, like I haven't, I don't know if ping pong's going to win <laughs> the sports anime poll, but if it doesn't, I've gotten my ping pong fix maybe between these two. And they have to be recommended by at least two first graders. Right. And they have to carry out missions under an active first grade or a first grade equivalent sorcerer. Now here's the, here's the um this is the rub, right? Because they have to carry out missions under a first grade or first grade equivalent in order to advance to first grade status. So they're going to start out as semigrades, right? That's what they're going to these five have to pass a trial and they're going to be semigrades. And then if they pass, they advance to first grade, right? And they have to be with a first grade equivalent. Now, the only question is, could Gojo be a part of that? I mean, Yuta's off on his mission. Yuki, we don't know where she is. Gojo's actively still around. So could they hang out with Gojo for their missions? That's why well, I'd pick him. <laughs> I'd be like, I'd be like, I'd choose Gojo to go on the missions with. We'll be fine. I'd pick him. Um, I, I'd be in that. Like, could Gojo be an option? Is Yagi allowed to go out? Uh, missions the principal I don't know um I could see Panda and like Yaga going out on missions together the principal and doing their thing um so basically you have possibly you have Toto, Meimei, Nanami of those three along with possibly Udahime maybe Gojo and there's five of them so it would make sense for Megumi and Gojo to go on a mission together it would make sense for Meimei and Nobara to go on a mission together it would make sense for Yuji and Nanami to go on a mission together. It would make sense for maybe Panda and Udahime to go together. And maybe Maki and Toto. I could see that. Maybe that would be the mix-up. I could see that. I don't know. But who that leaves as not first grade? Uh, is Miwa? I don't think so. Um, not our boy with the voice whose name? Uh, Inumaki. There we go. Inumaki. Not him. Um... Mm, not May, right? And then Kamo, not him. And then obviously Mekamaru, which we'll talk about Mekamaru. So those all were kind of left behind. I mean, I guess if Yudo came back and came to school, he could go with one of them, but I don't think that's going to be the case. I don't think Yuda's coming back. I think Yuda, I don't think Yuda's going to come back into the picture until later in the season once we get this mission underway, because I think Gojo has something reserved for him. I don't know. Gojo, since the movie, and since the incident in episode five, not only has Gojo been getting stronger, but I feel like he is preparing himself and is much more cautious than he was before, with ample reason. And so I feel like since season one, he's probably even more cautious too. So... Ah, we'll see, right? I like the lights flickering as they go to this tennis table. And God, Tojo's legs. He did not skip leg day. I love it. And then May just walking alongside him. And they can be assigned their own first grade missions. Following the results of those missions, they either will or won't officially become first grade sorcerers. Yeah. My brother will certainly accept the recommendation. So they can turn it down. So they can turn it down if they don't approve. Um, Yuji would probably accept it. Nobara would accept it. Maki would accept it. She wants to be the leader of the Zenin clan. Panda, I think, will accept it. Would Megumi accept it? Maybe? Would, does Megumi think he wants to be a first grade sorcerer? I don't know. And then Mei Mei. I just love the back and forth between them. And the thing about it is, you guys want to talk about, I know a lot of people will talk about, um, shipping and we're going to talk about that in this episode because y'all know how I am. But I will argue because some people have been like, oh, will you just ship to... Somebody, somebody commented on like episode five. They're like, you just ship Gojo and Ghetto because they're two dudes. And I'm like, 
we're not even going to start on that train. But I will say that in shows, there's a reason people ship. And there is a reason that people connect characters together because of their interactions and their chemistry and the context and the things between the line, like body language, subtle nuances, things like that. This tennis match is a prime example of a platonic situation. They're having this back and forth banter. It's great. Do I feel any like sexual tension in it? No. <laughs> Do I feel like a romantic attraction between Mei Mei and Toto? No. I don't. I feel like this is a great example of two platonic characters of opposite genders that are just having a moment, having a conversation. She trolls him at the end and then we go on our way. End of story. I feel like that's totally a thing, right? That's totally a thing. Whereas you have Miwa and Mekamaru later who are in a scene together and there's so much chemistry and tension with her like poking him and stuff and then him thinking about her in that moment like when he's inside the robot. Like that is sexual tension. That is romance. That is attraction. That between Mekamaru and Miwa. Toto and Meimei, nah. They're just having a tennis match, right? I am going to take a picture of the screenshot because it's of Toto uh, firing the tennis ball and it looks amazing. But yeah, so they have this conversation back and forth. It's great. And then he's like, I can't wait to face all these missions together, him and I. And Mei Mei's like, oh, oh, you mean, well, we can't do that. He goes on about destiny and stuff. And she's like, no, you, you can't do that. If you recommend them, you're not allowed to go on missions with them. Which makes total sense, right? Because it would be easy and very political for you to choose someone to be a first grade so that they can go on missions with you and team up with you. So it's the rule that if you recommend someone, you don't get to work with them. I think it'd be cool to see Mei Mei and Obara work together. I think it'd be cool to see Mei Mei and Megumi work together because she has the power to, with the animals and he has the he has the Chimera Garden and all this. I think it'd be amazing if Megumi and Mei Mei could work together. Yes, please. Let's get that. Poor Toto, though. So then we have the girl showing up with Nobara and she's like grown really tall and she's like, who are you? And then we have the OP. I'm already on board with the OP. It is freaky as hell. It's creepy. It has, you know what it has? It has a ghost festival vibe. I'm reading Heaven Official's Blessing right now and there's lots of ghost festivals. It feels very like Halloween, very, very creepy, which right now at the time the story is taking place, it's October. Um, if we look at the, by the time we hit October, we're going to be halfway through, halfway through, uh, this season by the time we hit, hit Halloween. Hmm. Is that by design? Could be. But yeah, God, this OP. I feel like I'm going to be analyzing it the whole time, the Shibuya incident, but God, it's really good. And it's a great contextless thing. I'm sure there's going to be stuff in this that I see later that I'm going to be like, wow, that was a spoiler. I have no clue right now. There were a couple shots I wanted to look at because I thought they were really, really good. Um, where's the one shots? There's like, there's a little boy holding Mei Mei's axe. Who the fudge is that? Is that Inumaki? Or is it like, he looks like he's in like later hosen. Like who is holding Mei Mei's axe? And Kong is there too. Old, old Cher Kong. No, old Kong, the, the former detective, according to the subtitles, is there. And then we have Gojo. Gojo's outside that KFC. <laughs> you can't get away from the KFC. And then, man, I think my favorite moment of the whole trailer is, of the whole OP, is Mahito skipping like a little schoolgirl through the train and then just people just dying right after him. I, oh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Freaking love it. It's probably my favorite part of the whole OP is him just going through the, the train and killing everybody. And so then we have, we do have a close-up of some people there. Han, uh, Hanami is there. Ghetto is there, um, Jogo is there, and the one, the one brother with the pigtails, he is there. And then there's all the fingers. Now, and my dogs are chasing each other. Now, the scary part here is we see um, all the fingers. Yuji is like very sad, and it looks like he's in front of, are those lockers of dead bodies? Is that what that is? And then we see a flame. We see like picture of Jugo and like some very old traditional artwork style. We see Hanami in the old traditional artwork, right? Uh, the shot of Toto kissing the necklace is a really good shot. I'm like, I'm not attracted to, to Toto's character at all, but he looks really good there. And then, oh, we see Mechamaru, right? That was the, we see Mechamaru's like Gundam now, his Eva unit now that we know, again, contextless spoilers. And then all the hands. 
And I don't know if that's Nobara or Itahime. Sukuna showing up. Yes, we're going to talk about him in a minute. And then there's like all bodies going everywhere. Stuff is crazy is happening. There's a shot of Mahito versus Yuji that's really, really good that I'm like really fascinated by, but I don't want to focus too much on the OP. And then the poor brother, the cursed brother is like screaming, what the hell is happening? And then, yeah, just all sorts of crazy stuff happening. But I don't want to look too much into the OP because we still have lots of stuff to talk about. And then Gojo's there, obviously. What is even going on? Don't know. Mojito's domain expansion's there, which is creepy. All the hands. Gege needs to quit showing off that he can draw hands. Whatever. So, so we go to the restaurant, the family restaurant, and Nobara's making friends with uh, this one girl who has now grown to be like six foot tall or whatever. And she's like, what happened to you? And she's like, oh, well, I grew about 15 centimeters and I dyed my hair. And she's like, oh my gosh. And Nobara's just like, I can't believe that you, you look like a totally different person. And there's Itadori standing next to her. Mm -hmm. I worked up the courage to ask for a photo with him. Now, it's totally fine that she's gotten taller and has lost weight because of her height, right? That's fine. The thing that kind of made me sad, though, was whenever she's like, oh, well, that and the stress. And I was like, hmm. Because, yeah, I, I feel like body image is definitely a, may, a big thing with women. I've had my own, like, body dysmorphia moments where you just don't feel attractive at all. And you focus on your flaws so much. And it just, it's very easy to fall prey to that trap and feel like you're not attractive or pretty. And so I hate the fact that she views herself as not attractive because she was pretty. She had a very grumpy face. <laughs> Her facial expression was very grumpy, but she wasn't unattractive. She was pretty. Like, I was just like, uh, beauty standards are hell, right? But what I, that makes me love Yuji all the more, right? And she's like, when I saw Itadori Kun earlier, I didn't know. So Yuko's her name that she's like, when I saw him earlier, I thought maybe with how I looked that I might, you know, get him to be attracted. What I love is that there's the unspoken, they know what each other is, is saying or meaning. Whereas Nobara's like, wait a minute, you mean you like UG like that? You mean it's like that? And she's like, it's like that. And their faces become like some kind of weird Western cartoon with how they're drawn. I love it though. They're like, yes, it's like that. Like it just, you know, and then Nobara's instantly like, Okay, we gotta call up Megumi. We gotta get him over here. We gotta talk about if Yuji has a girlfriend or not, or if this has legs, whatever's happening. Freaking love it. I love it. I love it so much. I wanna get pictures. I love when she's suddenly super serious. It just feels right out of the manga, and it's so great. And she's like, oh, hello, is Fishy Girl still riding with you? <laughs> I'm gonna just sit you the year all off the restaurant we're at. She's like, we need to find out. Someone who knows Itadori very well. I like that she gets Megumi to come over because she says she doesn't believe she knows Yuji enough to determine if he has a girlfriend or not. I'm like, girl, he's in your inner circle. How do you not know him? And that's when Yuko is like, do you like him? And she's like, no. <laughs> she's like, even if hell froze over and danced the Labata, I would not be attracted to him. Oh my God, no. And we see the beach scene with the same flowers. That's something that I love too about this series is that the main trio, the main trio does not shy away from the fact that Yuji and Nobara are not a couple. I, I can't tell you how often in season one as I was watching the series, as I was watching season one, people were like, I totally ship Nobara and Yuji. And I'm like, I, I'm not gonna judge a ship. I'm not gonna judge. You all don't judge me for liking Ghetto and Gojo. I'm not gonna judge. Um, but, but where? <laughs> I mean, really though. I mean, really though. There's like no chemistry romantically between Nobara and Yuji that I can see. You know, they're not. They're not weeping over each other. They very much are platonic friends to me. Now, if you ship Nobara and Yuji, I won't judge you. You, you do you. Your, your opinions are valid, but I'm just like, eh. To me, where I see it as is that you have Yuji. I don't really ship Yuji with anybody, to be honest. Um, so him and this Yuko girl, him and this Yuko girl, sure. 
I don't want it to happen because I feel she's gonna die. <laughs> like, I, anybody that I feel remotely could be shipped with Yuji, I'm like, he is like a walking death trap. No, no, no. You don't want to get around him because he's being targeted by Mahito and by Ghetto, and he has the fingers of Sukuna. I'm like, you do not want to get around Yuji. That's not a good idea. You will probably die. So, uh, for Yuko's sake, I hope that he turns her down gently and she can get away from here because he's already lost Junpei. He doesn't need to lose her. So let's not do that. And then Nobara, no. Nobara, no. They are just friendos. Um, same thing with, with Yuji and Toto. Again, you want to talk about bromance? Ultimate bromance. Yuji and Toto are destined to be best bros forever, but it is totally platonic. There is nothing gay about them. <laughs> now, Megumi is interesting because Megumi kind of outright doesn't... Megumi is the one ship that I'm like, I can get behind Yuji and Megumi because there is a foundation there, right? Where Megumi was willing to save Yuji's life. Like them, whenever they face each other back in episode four of season one and everything from then. Like there was a foundation to their relationship there that I totally get on board with. And I feel like Yuji and Megumi kind of balance each other out really well. And over time throughout season one, I've kind of drifted away from the Megumi and Yuji ship. But if I'm being honest, in this episode, it dawned on me whenever we'll get to Megumi part, something dawned on me that I was kind of like, I had this revelation mid episode and was like, oh my God, I am thinking this now. I didn't understand. And so I also like that Nobara has this moment where she's like, my chest felt weird. Why did my heart skip a beat? And for a second I was like, are you really thinking you're in love with Yuji? And then we find out later, no, she realizes she has to get a boyfriend before him. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. Although I do ship Nobara with Maki. I do. If you told me that Nobara was a bisexual queen, I'd be all for it. But I totally feel there is like chemistry between Nobara and Maki for sure. And I'm like, yes, please, all about it. But they get Megumi to come over and they're like, does Itadori have a girlfriend? This is Yuko. And I like that all she says is, oh, she's actually blah, blah, blah. And Megumi is like, it's like that. And she's like, it's like that. It felt like a juju stroll. It felt like absolute comedy. But you know that Gege is just like, in Gege's mind, this is how the kids talk. He's like, this is how the kids talk to each other about liking each other. And so it's the same lingo, the same way between Megumi and Nobara. Freaking love it. And he's like, he definitely doesn't have a girlfriend. See, I love that. He's like, no, he doesn't. And she's like, what's your basis? He's like, he suddenly transferred to Tokyo. He didn't seem upset about it. So he's not worried about leaving someone behind. And plus he has a pinup hanging up over his room. Anyone with a girlfriend wouldn't have something like that hanging up, right? Because she'd hate it. Now, that line there is very targeted because Megumi saying that about Yuji shows how much that he considers about Yuji's character. Because my theory is that he probably... After his mother died, we know that Toji went back to his old ways. It's very possible that Toji was kind of sleazy, went back and repressed to his old ways, and that's Megumi's basis of comparison. Now, when M Toji was married to Mama Fushiguro, probably not the case. But to Megumi, the fact that he considers Yuji so different than his father shows that maybe that's why he cares about him. He's like, you're not like my dad. I like you. But also he puts Yuji up onto a higher pedestal saying, well, Yuji, if he had a girlfriend, wouldn't have that poster because that's not a gentlemanly thing to do. And Nobara's like, so you're the type to drink black coffee when women are around so you can show off and make yourself look cool, huh? And he's like, I always drink my coffee black. And I'm like, oh my God, Megumi is that guy. He's that guy on campus that drinks black coffee, knows all the secrets about women and being a gentleman. She's like... He doesn't have an acoustic guitar. He has a freaking cello. But yeah, I love Nabara's like, I just, I can't believe you. And she's like, stop that. And he's like, you asked me to come out here and give you my advice. He's like, I always drink my coffee black, by the way. And she's like, do you know what his type is like? And Megumi is like, well, he mentioned that he likes tall girls. And I love that Nabara's like, she, she gets, she's like, you have a chance. Yes. I like Nabara being the ultimate wing woman is the most amazing thing ever. I freaking love it. It's amazing. She's like, I'll oh, summon it a Dory. We'll get him over here. And then I like, she's like, you have to come. And meanwhile, meanwhile, Megumi is like reading a manga while they're sitting there waiting. It's the cutest thing. I love it. Mm -hmm. And then he shows up and Nabara is afraid he's not going to recognize her because she's changed so much. But he instantly knows her 
you instantly recognize her. And I love that Megumi and them are like, 10 out of 10. He's a 10. 10's across the board. I freaking love him. I love his character so much. 10's across the board. Like, the fact that he didn't even question who she was. It's because that's how Yuji is. He doesn't, he doesn't judge people like that. And he's like, which girl in our class do you like, Itadori? And then he says her. And he's like, oh, I'd pick o Ozawa. The way she eats in her handwriting and stuff are super nice. And all the guys are really mean. They call her fat. And she's like, he's like, I don't care about that. And then, yeah, he's like, that's its own thing. The girls, the celebrity girls that I like. And it's so, it's crazy. And then they end up, and the funny thing is, is that as she's walking away, she's like, I hated all other boys other than Itadori-kun. And she's like, I never realized that I could be liked for the things that you liked me for. And so she like talked about changing herself, but then she's like, I just be becoming what they want me to become. And that's not right. I'd be living the same standards as the people that I hate. Now there was like a moment where her shadow and stuff like transitioned and squiggled. So I'm like, is she going to end up having like a curse follow her? Is that going to end up happening? I don't know if I, if I want that. And then he says, he'll see her later. And then he like walks around with her and then, and that's it. But what's interesting is that her shadow, when she walks again, it's not squiggly like it was before. It's like almost as if the curse isn't quite there like it was previously. <laughs> Meanwhile, Megumi's got all these snacks and stuff. And he's like, was that okay? They could have at least exchanged numbers. And she's like, oh, I exchanged with her. I gave her a number. It's okay. <laughs> like I did it for her. And she's like, I finally realized my own feelings. And he's like, really? She's like, I the thought that Itadori might land a girlfriend before I get a boyfriend pisses me off. And he's like, oh, is that so? And then Yuji comes back and she's like, walk behind me. And he's like, why are you saying that for? What are you guys talking about? And then I love Fishy Girl gives him like the bag of groceries and he gets the stuff from her. And they go to see the movie all three together. And Yuji, of course, knows that Megumi likes caramel popcorn. It's like, it's so sweet. It's like these really sweet moments. It's so precious. It's like the three of them together. And what I love is that you could say that all three of them, you could say that that none of them have any romantic or like romantic shippable feelings towards one another. And that's fine. It's fine for me that Eugene Obara and Megumi aren't together in any capacity. It's fine that they're just friends. I love that dynamic. It works really well for them. But I've realized something about myself when I was watching this episode. Something that I was, I've been in denial about since season one and I've not understood, I've not understood the appeal of until now. And I was like, oh no. And that is, I don't ship Yuji and Megumi, and you all know where this is going. I don't ship Yuji and Megumi. They're like friendos. It's fine. But I kind of ship Megumi and Sukuna. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. You're like, Romania, why? But hear me out. Hear me out. We know that Fushiguro has this crazy side to him, right? We know he has this crazy side to him. And he's been like a delinquent before. And he's super quiet. But it's always the quiet ones, right? And he's super quiet. But he's kind of delinquent. And he's built up this mound of middle school kids that he's beaten up. And he has this crazy side to him. And he's kind of a prodigy like Gojo. Kind of a prodigy like his dad. And so I'm like, Yuji's too vanilla for Megumi. It won't work. He needs... He needs... Uh, Megumi can handle crazy because he's, you know, he's grounded enough. He can handle some crazy... And you have Sukuna in Yuji's body. Just, I can't explain it, but it hit me. I was like, you know what? I, I realized I was okay with Megumi and Yuji being platonic friends. Totally fine with it. And then I was like, oh my God, but I really like Sukuna, Sukuna and Megumi. Ah! So yeah, we're just going to leave it at that. We're not going to talk anymore about it. We've not even seen Sukuna. Sukuna, it's so funny. In season one, I thought we'd see him all the time. Now I'm like, we're going to see him like three times this season. I guarantee it. Like, that'll be it. So anyway, it's like that. It's like that. This is how it is. Yep. And they're like, is it like that? It's like that. So then Gojo is telling uh, Udahime that it's possible the person in question may think that they're only working with cursed users, though, and not with cursed spirits. So we have to figure out 
what any and i like that gojo leaves the investigation up to udahime because he trusts her and i like that gojo gojo who's often you know that we've seen is worried about his friends and their well-being he knows udahime is going to be okay for what it's worth that she can handle this but they determine that it's mekamaru that Mekamaru, it's not, we, we know that it's not somebody, it's either one of two people. It's somebody who's in the higher up. She's like, we have no control over that because I'm not that high on the pay grade. Or it's somebody passing off information. So we think that the current target is that. And they believe it's somebody who would have access to puppets they can use, which is Mekamaru. The sad thing is we see Miwa come in. She says, today's the last day of turning your notebook. The thing is, when she sees Mekamaru and he's like, oh, I'm going to sleep. It may be, it may very well be the last time they see one another. Which is so heartbreaking. Because he loves her. And she loves him. And I ship Miwa and Mekamaru so much. And I've shipped them since season one. And the fact that she sees him, he's like, I'm sorry, Miwa, I'm going to sleep for a bit. Like that, like right before he meets up with Ghetto and Mahito. And I love the fake out. That we think that it's them that they're meeting up with, but it was Mahito and Ghetto the whole time, not Yuji and the other two. And then Miwa, she's like, oh, he really is asleep. And she just pokes him. Like that whole scene with them, that that chemistry, that the, just the vibes, that is romantic. That is, it just, it sends me. I love it so much. It's so cute. And then they get into the basement, Koichi Muda. Koichi Muda is Mekamaru. I love the greens and the reds. It's great. And he's like, I like that she establishes his powers involve using puppets. And in that moment, you just like, well, that doesn't seem, you know, it seems like it'd be something we could see and would be conspicuous. And she's like, well, what if they were the size of a fly? It's kind of interesting the way that Mekamaru, he's using puppets and the idea that they can be all different sizes and be different from what you expect kind of relates a little bit to Mahito and his transfiguration power of changing the shape of things. It, it's similar there. I love the reveal when we open up the door that there's nobody there and it's actually, he's somewhere else. I love it. And you know, because it's the green versus the red, right? The red where he's at does not match the green where they're at. And it's like the two paths don't cross. And there's this creepy, they show this, like, they show all the pipes and everything, right? The pipe that's leaking and the chair that was left. Super creepy, by the way. Just the chair and the pipe left over. And then him standing up. I thought you forgot about me. Again, Ghetto is not doing much. He's just talking about Pax. And the thing about it is, he talks... Ghetto talks a lot about Pax here. And so the idea that we know that Muda made a pact to be able to control the puppets, right? Because of his body and how disfigured it is. But then he talks about how when you make a pact with somebody, you have to go through with it. Otherwise, the penalty for not, for breaking the pact can backfire horrendously on you. Like if you've gained all of it, if you've leveled up 10 levels and you break the pact, you'll lose all of that advancement. You'll go back to level one and you'll lose all the power that you gained. And Mojito's obviously like, well, I worked really hard for that power. I don't want to do it. Mojito is terrifying because he's just such chaos and doesn't seem to truly care he's just there having fun and those type of villains are always dangerous because they don't necessarily have an agenda they're just doing stuff because they it feels nice right but ghetto says that if you break a pact the penalty you don't know how severe it's going to be which leads me to think that maybe ghetto whatever curse is possibly inhabiting ghetto has made a pact with his corpse how do we know that ghetto didn't make a pact with a curse and said, oh yeah, if you, I'll, I'll get to live if I let you take over. But if you take over, I get to retain my consciousness. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. The ghetto, maybe ghetto made a pact as he was dying with a curse inside of him. Maybe, because we think that Gojo killed him. Whatever. And then maybe as he was dying, there was a curse inside of him that he like had mental telepathy with and was like, he made a pact and the curse is like, I'll keep you alive, but you have to give me your body and I get to control you. And maybe Ghetto was like, fine, but I get to retain my consciousness. Maybe, I don't know. We'll find out. I have a feeling that we're going to find out the truth about Ghetto and what's going on by the end of this season because 
why wouldn't we? You know, why wouldn't we find out about Ghetto and the truth behind all of this? Because we've built up the entire movie in season one and half of the season building up Ghetto's character and his rivalry, his rival with Gojo post him leaving the Jiu-Jitsu Sorcerers. So why wouldn't we reveal that? He's like, I agreed to cooperate. In exchange, he would use his idol transfiguration to fix his body. Which is such a, it's an interesting thing because on the one hand, Mechamaru has been waiting all this time, like building up all of this stuff to retaliate against the two of them. But it's also like you betrayed your friends and gave all this information just so you could have the chance to fight back. It's, it's a complicated web, right? That's the pact we forged. And Ghetto's like, we can kill him after we finish the pact. Killing comes after fixing him. And he's like, okay. I wanted him to do some work for us in Shibuya too, so that's a shame. So whatever they had planned in Shibuya, uh, Muda is not going to be able to help them with, right? We won't lay a hand on the people from the Kyoto school. You're the ones that broke the pact first. So yeah, so Muda's like, I was going to help you at Shibuya, but then you hurt the Kyoto school students. So I said, no, that's not what we agreed on. And they're like, well, technically that was Hanamaki that broke the pact, not us. Hanami is the one that did it. And he's like, you shouldn't lash out at the wrong people. He's like, I'm not going to argue with the cursed spirit. Fix me, you scumbag. The fact that he could talk back to Mojito is great. And Ghetto is great, right? Oh, my God. And then us getting to see what he looks like when he's all fixed up. It was like a Sailor Moon transformation. It was just like a Sailor Moon Little Mermaid mix of transformations there. It was great. But, yeah. So, the deal was he was going to give information to them and work through, through whatever the Shibuya incident is going to be. Um, but... That doesn't end up happening because Hanami, I want to call him Hanamaki, Hanami broke the pact by attacking them at the school. So he's like, nope, all bets are off. And then Ghetto's like, we have to keep up with the pact. You can't break it. And then they're like, you're lower than a scumbag, so be grateful. And you can tell Mahito doesn't like using his power to fix him, but also the fact that it does have to make you turn purple at first like it did for Junpei, good to know. Good to know. And then it ends up like he has a Sailor Moon transformation. It's great. I love it. And then, yep, I'm like, he's he's a real boy. He <laughs> comes out with just, oh my gosh, he looks great. I It's so weird to see Muda look so good and Bing have his limbs and everything. It's great. And then I love the image of all of the Mechamarus. Yes, please. All the Mechamarus around him. Freaking love it. Absolutely love it. They give us, of course, like a little tease with the fight scene between Mahito and the Mechamarus. Just a little tease. Just a little taste of what's to come. They're like, we'll give you one little fight scene. That's all you get. But it's great. It's absolutely wonderful. I love it. I love it. And then that's how he used to escape. And then uh, Mahito's having the time of his life. Mahito wants to fight. He wants to battle somebody through everything like he's excited and the idea that he shows back up in this giant eva unit the ultimate mechamaru mode absolute armored puppet ultimate mechamaru prototype zero we'll just call it an eva unit <laughs> i love it it's great and it was from a shot from the op all right and he's like I, it is a little bit ironic and scary though that mechamaru who spent his entirety of existence controlling puppets while stuck inside a shell, is now has a body that's functional, but he's back to being stuck inside a shell with the, controlling a puppet. So it's like the irony of all ironies, right? And they're like, he's there in the cockpit. Mm -hmm. But he has like all this crazy, insane tech. Like he's just sitting there. He has 17 years worth of cursed energy stored up, which is insane, right? He has, like, all this, like, range of vision. He has all this footage access. And he can use the years of cursed energy as a weapon. Like, he uses a year's worth, supposedly get Mihito at first. I don't think it's going to do anything. But his main goal, I like that he's, like, they lowered a veil, which is a problem. This won't be as easy as it was for Gojo. He's, like, I need to get a hold of Gojo. I need to tell, I need to tell Gojo that I'm here so that Gojo can come and rescue me. <laughs> He's like, I have to tell him about the Shibuya plot, which does not make me feel good 
about Mechamaru's chances of getting out of this alive. No, it does not, because we know this whole arc is about the Shibuya incident or whatever happens. So the fact that he's like, I have to get to Gojo and tell him, means that I don't think he's going to get to Gojo and tell him. Which is concerning. So he's got to try to get either to Miwa and tell her, or get to Gojo physically, or find a way to communicate to him. And the veil is preventing a lot of that. So... I, I just don't get good vibes. I don't get good vibes. I I am going to be really sad if we get Mechamaru in a new body looking as good as he does and have this battle with, with Mihito for him to die. I'm going to feel really sad and then Miwa is going to be like heartbroken and she won't even know. I'm like, okay. okay. I get a, and again, Ghetto is just standing there and he's like, oh, don't mind me. I'm just going to stand here. And he's like, this is a problem. I have a chance to win. And he's like, I'm going to use, I'm going to burn him with this ultra cannon. And Mito's like, oh, hey, what? Now, the um, the ED is very simple. Very simple. Uh, I like the song for it a lot, though. But it feels like a very simple ED. I, I'm going to guess we have 18 episodes. I'm going to guess that this OP is going to be good for at least 9 or 10. Halfway through. And then we'll get a new OP and ED, maybe. I don't know. I don't get good vibes from Ekamaru, which sucks because I really like his character and where it's gone. And I like this development, but it just feels like someone displaying their whole hand of cards that they're like, ah, here's this ultimate mecha robot. Here's all these other mechas. I've got a new body. Here's all the things I need to do. I got to go warn Gojo. And I'm like, you're not going to warn Gojo because they're going to kill you. I'm like, did we get 13 minutes of happiness and the next 18 episodes are going to be tragedy? <laughs> The gay game be like, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you laughed. I hope you had a good time. Now it's going to be pain. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> ah, so I don't know. I don't know. I could probably, I could probably dress up as Mechamaru as Muda next week and have like a big, big top button thing sticking out. I could probably do that. I think I could make that work. That'd be an easy cosplay. Could do that. Could do that. But man, I, I'm really excited, y'all, about this season. This episode was a fantastic leap back into the series after a few weeks on hiatus. I loved it. I'm ready for it to go. I'm not ready for the pain. I don't know anything about Shibuya. All I know about Shibuya is anytime it's brought up, the fandom goes, <laughs> and that's all. And that's all I want to know. That's all I want to know. I've waited two years, I've waited spoilers, and now we get to see what all the, all the hubbub is about. So with that being said, please no spoilers, no hints or clues from the manga, but I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe, take care, and yeah, I'll be back next week with episode seven of Jujutsu Kaisen.